If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. God, Sam Parr. Hustle Con, man. If you guys have not checked out this dude, I, I mean, Impressive. I bet you, we, I mean, we have a decent amount of millennials that listen to us. They probably already know or they probably already subscribe. He's got over, what, 600,000 now subscribers to the Hustle Con. Hustle. His, which, his, it's basically a newsletter that he does through email. He is uh, a, a pretty fascinating young entrepreneur and you just I didn't realize a, how young he was because he sounds so mature he's a 28 yeah. years 28 year old kid right yeah within he, a within a year and a half has built himself a multi-million dollar taking over the world he's uh he gives a lot of gold uh in this episode in terms of building a business starting a business very interesting fascinating story yeah um fun to listen to fun to fun to do while we were doing it no no i was really excited to talk to him because I, he has at, there's a lot of people there's like two camps right now in the emailing world and because we have all this ability to connect to people on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram instantly, uh, you have one camp that thinks that email is dead. The future is for you to have this personal connection through so- social media. And those guys that are still living in the email world are silly. Then you have the other camp, which he stands in, which I was excited to talk to a young, young entrepreneur like him who is like, absolutely not. It's not dead. It's just that people are using it incorrectly mm. or they ha- they haven't evolved with how to use it properly because they don't see the value in it's it. extremely personable. In fact, it can be more personable than all the social media bullshit. And he has mastered it, mastered it to a point where his open rate is like 46%. That's insane. We talk about keeping our open rate over 20 something percent. Right. So, and I think that we connect with our audience really well. So to see somebody... Uh, do that and then to be able to get some tips for him. So if you're an entrepreneur, you got to tune into this episode Dive through his stuff. Share this with any of your friends that are entrepreneurs. They're going to love this episode. Check out his stuff. His website is thehustle.co. Also, uh, this month, what do we got going on, Adam? Aren't we giving out shirts? Giving away shirts for all the, all the bundle people. So if you're getting hooked up with any of our bundles, uh, any gonna- of our maps bundles, we have the sexy athlete bundle, which combines maps aesthetic and maps performance and melds them together so that you can train like an athlete but also have a focus on balance and symmetry like a bodybuilder. You also- build your butt bundle. Build your butt bundle where we teach you how to wake up what's called a sleepy butt where if you're not connected to your glutes, you can do all squats and deadlifts in the world, you're not going to build effective glutes. Well, this build your butt bundle includes a modification that teaches you how to, how to wake them up, but it also includes... Maps Anabolic and Maps Aesthetic, both together for like 20-something percent off. And then we have the Super Bundle, uh, which is uh, Maps Anabolic, Maps Performance, Maps Aesthetic, and Maps Prime, and Maps Anywhere. So you have a year of exercise programming. All those programs together, about 30% off. You get in any, any of these bundles, you get a free limited edition T-shirt. You missed one of our most popular bundles that we have going on right now, too. It's our correctional one, which is our Prime Pro mm, bundle. That's right. A lot of people that are just getting started and they're kind of weary about what program they should do and they're not certain if they're ready for it. they got aches and pains going on in their joints and they kind of want to ease their way in. We always recommend to these people that invest in the Prime Pro bundle because this is mm-hmm. all centered around correctional. It, has, it comes with a compass test to see where your imbalances are and then you can focus on addressing that first, it's a great way to transition it's into any you up for success. Right. Absolutely. So you can get any of these bundles, uh, and if you want just information on mindpumpmedia.com. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Sam Parr, the CEO of the Hustle. Talk to us a little bit about because we're going to have some listeners who aren't familiar with the Hustle, with what you do and what you guys are. Can we, can we let's let's give a, just a quick breakdown of that and then talk about how you got that started. Yeah. So the hustle, we call it a membership company. Uh, A lot of people call it a media company. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I I think of us as a, as a media or a membership company. And basically we have about uh, now we're, we're getting at close to 600,000 members. So 600,000 people a day who consume our news. And so every single morning at 9 a.m. Pacific, we have our team, they send out all the business news you need to know throughout the day. Uh, to 600,000 people. And it's almost like our content is like a combination of the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg meets The Daily Show. So it's witty hmm. and funny, yet it's intelligent and people, uh, it's it's uh, accurate. 
You know, awesome. It's not like the onion. And it's three it's all three email. So, yeah. So when we started, we made the decision early on. We're like, what if we built a whole media company via email as opposed to having a website? What if our e- email was the website? And so that's when we launched. And we also host huge events. So we have a, an event called HustleCon where we'll get like three thousand people come. Um, and it's where we get some amazing entrepreneurs and they come and they tell their story. Um, and we're gonna be launching other products soon. So what's interesting to me about this is, you know, when we got into this indus- into this business and we're 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 a we're a media fitness company, right? And we're talking about producing lots of media. And uh, when people would bring up things like email, they would say things, uh, the way I would think about it is, God, email, that feels old. It doesn't feel as as new as some of the other tech, like websites and this and that. But the reality is it's the opposite, right? It's more effective to work through email to give to deliver people directly. Yeah, and when you think about it, like think about it really at its core, email is like a protocol. Email, email is the internet and and. It has not. I mean, email has existed since the since the, the internet has been around. Right. And email, like realistically, it's been static for decades. I mean, what's like the biggest change that your email has had in like two decades? It's like the fact that Google put a promo tab and a social tab. <laughs> right. That's like that's kind of been it. Right. And so it's just like really really stable. Whereas companies who have gotten traffic from Facebook, that shit changes every quarter. People are like, I'm getting way less traffic from Facebook, or Google just made a change. This that it just like changes all the time. We were just talking about this. I, you know, know a guy who his business was based off of Facebook and Facebook advertising. Yeah, he's gonna and, get fucked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was no, not a Explain joke. Explain that. That's a, it's a fucking great point. Well, I'm gonna tell you what happened, and then I want you to explain uh, maybe to our listeners. But this is what happened to him. The guy was making something like ninety thousand dollars a month in revenue through Facebook advertising and overnight he made something like he went down to like 7 or 8 grand a month like yeah. a ridiculous reduction in revenue Zuckerberg has a, an opinion he farts or whatever and, and, and things change <laughs> yeah. that, and your business and your livelihood has just changed so basically the the history of this is basically uh, Facebook came out in 2009 or 2008, whenever it came out, and media companies were like, okay, great, this is awesome, we're going to get a ton of traffic from there. Everyone like our page, and they would get, let's say, for rounding numbers, a million people to like their Facebook page. Every time they posted an article, one million people would see that article, and a smaller percentage of that would click on their article and go to that website, and they would earn money from advertising revenue, right? Well, over time, what happened was uh, every other company was like, oh, great, likes that." Likes can turn to traffic, which turned to customers. Awesome. Let's get a Facebook page. And then some people, like for example, the guy who started like sites like the Viral Nova, they're like, "Oh, this is interesting. Um, we we can use this for arbitrage, basically." And so Facebook, it's a supply and demand thing. They only have a certain amount of uh, of of demand, which is eyeballs. And they started getting way more media companies than they could possibly. Like you know, every media company went on there and they would mm. post twenty five articles a day. Ah. And so what that meant is like, oh. okay, well, look. You're only scrolling through a certain amount of a certain amount of content. Therefore, now we've got to pick and choose. So, although you have a million likes, now only eighty percent of your audience is going to see each article. And then these guys like Viral Nova were like, "Look, oh, only eighty percent are seeing our article. We got to make our shit more cl- clickbaity in order to reach ninety percent." And then everyone started making it more clickbaity. So then Facebook said, "Okay, that's a that's a horrible experience." And B, now we've got uh, more supply than demand. There's more content than actual eyeball. So let's bring it down even oh. further. And so now, if you have a million likes on Facebook, on average, you'll probably reach 7% of your people. Damn, that's what? it? Maybe nine, but yeah. That's a fucked number. Oh, it's horrible. And so basically, there's, there's, <laughs> it go, you can go and you can look at this right now. Go to Elite Daily's Facebook page. You'll see they've got maybe 10 million likes or 5 million, something like that. And a pay, and an article will get like three likes and two comments. Now, did you did you have the foresight to see this, Sam? Because I feel like I've heard people have just... I remember when we were first building this, uh, I would re- I'd hear guys talking about how email is dead and that the future is Facebook. Did you foresee this happening and that's what made you go the email direction? A lot of people saw this happening, so I'm certainly not the only one. But yes, it was so clear. It was like, guys, this do the math. This is not wor- working. And now you, you have instant articles on Facebook. Right, you guys know you ever yep. see that how shit loads fast. Yep, it's clear what they're doing. They don't want anyone to leave their website. Hmm. So now you're like uh, media companies who you uh, who've been built on the backs of Facebook. In a way, they're just like people who have built like apps on Facebook. So you know, like those games, like the you know there there used to be like Farmville. Oh yeah, yeah. and what happens? Gone. When? <laughs> where are they? Yeah, Do those good. even exist anymore? Uh, like. Wow. 
Do you know what I mean? Right. And so like that shit's just gonna happen. Is this is this why now when I go through Facebook because I noticed something very interesting? Uh, pages would would post lots of pictures. Then it turned into it's different trends. Video. Yeah. And now what they do is, and what the video was because I think they were trying to get around the algorithm is they would post a video, but it would just be a picture. So it's just a plan. It's just one picture, I guess, because that got yep. around the algorithm. And then Facebook said, oh, the image isn't changing. We, un- we, we, we know how to figure that out now, so we're not going to give you any airtime or whatever. So now what they do, you'll see this on some of the videos. You'll, hit, you'll, 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 it'll, you'll scroll through, and it'll have these weird like little arrows and stuff floating around on this picture to trick the algorithm almost into thinking it's playing a video. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and you don't have to be you and me. We don't, we don't have to be smart like marketers or techie guys to know this. Everyone knows this, right? Like you start seeing these patterns. You're like, oh, that's things change. So the new thing that's going to happen is... Uh, and I know this because I have friends who work there, and and I it's just it's this is public this is public knowledge. The new things is f- Facebook's going to be making more changes this quarter, and what you're going to see is that they're going to prioritize group content over pages. Mm. So you'll see that soon. So basically, it's going to just get people who rely are mostly reliant on Facebook. And this is different from their ad <laughs> product. This is strictly organic content. Uh, you're going to see less and less of that, even more of of pages content in your in your feed. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. Now, you're talk about so I've watched videos and interviews of you before, but I want our audience to hear you talk about this. Um one of the things that fascinated me was your guys's open rate. Your open rate for the size of uh, size and the amount of people that you have that you're emailing. Talk about some of the things that you hacked into that I just I had first time ever hearing some of them were the stuff that you're doing. Yeah, so we have um I don't even know the specific number at the uh, top of my head today. It ch- is we, we grow at like two or 3,000 people a day. At, at t- today, it might be at f- close to 600,000. But uh, on average, ab- about 45, sometimes 50% of people will open that email. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, what, now, what is an industry average in comparison? Or what's considered good, I guess? Because um, that's obviously great. I think the the I think uh, like 20 or 21 oh, so is, double. Is, is average. Um, yeah, we're double. Um, a lot of people treat email as just like a newsletter mm-hmm. and we treat it as like the product. And because of that, it's created a habit amongst our users. And we also have built a ton Smart. of technology to make that a thing. You know, the idea was like, look, like um, what if we sent content to someone? And like when you're on your phone, what do you do in the morning? You pull out your phone and you look at your email. What the hell? Like, what's the difference between what you're looking at if it's in your email or on a website? I mean, Content is content. Right. Like the mm-hmm. screen is the same. Right. You have you could if you show that to someone, you literally just see a white page with. Text. If anything, you could argue it's more intimate because it's coming from your email, right? It is more intimate. Right. It's way more intimate because how many websites do you go to mm. a day? Not a lot. You don't literally type in that website right. each day. Not a lot, at mm-hmm. least. Um, except for Pornhub. Except for Pornhub. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I typed uh, that one in. <laughs> Pornhub and Reddit. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so like. It's just like, why would we even have anyone click off? Like, what if we just like in the same way that someone was like, look, podcasting is different from blogging and blogging is different from movies. Like a lot of people thought like, oh, it's content. Like it's actually totally different platforms. And so we're like, what if we just treated it as its own platform and went all in on it? And that was the idea. And so we, yeah, we've had to create a lot of technology to make that a thing, Um, but it's working. Now, when you look at all platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, emailing, what do you, I would love to talk to a guy like you and hear your opinion on all of them for building a business. Like, what do you, what do you see each of those, their strengths and their weaknesses? And how do you approach that? I'm not an expert on a lot of them, but I am an expert, I think, on email. But basically, we call our business a pirate ship, and every email is a win, a little bit of win in our sales. And the idea was like, how can we create something that um, we own? And basically, my life is like, I never, I hate being told what to do. And how could the business be the same way where we never have to be told what to do and Ooh. no one will be in control of our destiny? God, if like, I could mm-hmm. fist bump you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that was the goal. And email seemed like the best one. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't, we still, I guess, technically, if Gmail made a change, that would hurt us. Mm. But we have a lot of, um, Gmail isn't the only one, you know, there's only one Facebook, there are many. Right. If you really think about it, I mean, you're like, if I built a business on YouTube and I'm making millions of dollars on YouTube, if YouTube wanted to, 
they could fuck me completely. Which or, they are. It, which yeah. they do to a lot of people. Same thing with Facebook, same thing with other, other platforms. Even podcasting at the moment, iTunes is like the big dog. That's primarily everything. If iTunes wanted to, they could, you know, basically sever us from our audience. But what you're doing, you own that. Like nobody else, nobody can really mess with you as easily. Yes. And it's not to say that we or anyone else shouldn't go deep on some of these on some of these platforms that they don't own. They they should. They in fact they should. They should go where the attention mm-hmm. is. But they should diversify. You know, I want our traffic to look like a peace sign where it's like a third, a third, a third. You mm-hmm. know? And, and 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 before all that, you have to have good shit that people love right. and people want. So it's like if Jay Z is on Tidal or Spotify, I don't care. I'm if I want sure. Jay Z, I'm going. But it, it, let's say he's not on any of those, it's like, well, it's not accessible. It's kind of difficult or like I can't mm. discover it. It's, it makes it a lot harder. Let's talk about your content uh, here for a little bit. What what kind of information, what are you transmitting to your, your, your readers? What is your specialty? What is the hustle all about? Yeah, so we're uh, tech and business news. And um, so we have a very aspirational audience. It's almost like my parents are in their 60s now. So I almost explained mm. it's like my parents who are professionals, they own companies and they've done well. Just like imagine them like 35 years ago when they were younger. Um, people who want to make a dent in the world. So um, people who are builders and makers and entrepreneurs, we basically give them the content that they need to be intelligent and so- sound intelligent with their peers to actually be more intelligent and to get shit done. And so a lot of that is news. So like um, um, Kodak had an ICO the other day, which was interesting. We talked about that. Or Uber is always doing something crazy. So we make sure people are informed about that so they can make better decisions. Um, and we also uh, recommend uh, like different products to you. So like I love the reason I asked about that Jabra set you have there is I'm always into like gadgets and how to just be more efficient throughout the day. So we'll talk about that. So like I nerded out in the email the other day and wrote about my favorite notebooks because I like to uh, I like tested a series of notebooks. I want to know like which one paper's the smoothest and which one's actually the best. Oh, very cool. <laughs> um, and so we'll talk about that too. So whatever's going to benefit like the entrepreneur mind and, and, and their processes with that is pretty much what you're gearing it around. Entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. We, we we just help. We want to help. We want to help people make a dent in the world, and we'll give them whether that's a product recommendation or the news. At the moment, it's mostly news. But like I said, we're gonna we're, we're expanding into uh, we're expanding. Mm-hmm. Now I'm gonna make an assumption, and I'm gonna assume, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that you have a large percentage of your audience are in that millennial age group. Was that a, is that a safe assumption? That is a safe assumption. Okay. <laughs> now that's what we saw at that event. Really? That we yeah. So so at the, CES. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really? really? Lots of millennial activity. (laughs) So the reason why I, 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 first of all, I'll made that assumption, but the, the, the point I want to make is, uh, there's this stereotype that millennials, you know, live at home still. They don't want to really do anything. They're unmotivated. They, you know, they get their feelings hurt really easy, this, that, and the other. (laughs) But what I'm seeing, and maybe there's some truth to that, maybe not, but what I'm seeing is this, uh, they seem to be, one of the most entrepreneurial generations that I can, that I've seen since I've been alive. I'm not super old, but it seems like more and more people in that age group, more than almost any other, is trying to do something for themselves. And maybe part of that is technology is enabling them, uh, you know, like never before. Like I couldn't, you know, 30 years ago, I couldn't just post a video on something and then, it, right. you know, potentially go viral. And the other part of it is uh, the heroes of millennials are entrepreneurs. Whereas when I, when we were kids, a lot of our heroes were celebrities. Yeah. And now these people are looking up to like people like Steve Jobs and Elon Gary Musk v. and Gary yeah. Vee and that kind of stuff. Well, I think part of what you said is right. Like getting their feelings hurt and living at home. I mean, uh, I do think that, you know, our generation could be, it, it could be sensitive, but there's a lot of pros to that. There's a lot of cons and pros, but the pro is that I do agree that we, our generation, millennials are um, um, very aspirational but not only are they aspirational, and this is like a pro and con thing, there's a lot of downsides and, and upsides to this, is that they expect um, to be great and they expect to do great work and they expect to be happy with their work and they refuse to just have a job. They want a career and they want a mission. I think that mm-hmm. our generation is more mission-driven than uh, my parents' generation. Mm-hmm. Um, part of, out of necessity, but if you think about it, a, a millennial um, has mostly grown up in a fantastic market. So like yeah. I was... Uh, uh, I was 18 in 2008 when the financial crisis hit, right? I didn't know anything about that. I wasn't, it, it didn't meant nothing to me. Right. You weren't heavily vested yeah. somewhere or didn't have a house Your probably before that. Right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So unless they live in New York, 
what I, I lived in Missouri, so it didn't impact me at all. Mm-hmm. I was just like, I, I see this on TV and that's all I know. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I've come, I've grown up in a, in a bull market, in a great market. And so I see money flowing and I think I'm badass. And I know that <laughs> greatness is attainable because I also see my peers, whether it's a YouTuber or my actual friends, I see people living great lives. Mm-hmm. And so I expect that if I work hard, I can do the same. And I think a lot of people feel that way. If It's mm-hmm. like the gold rush, uh, you know, except, uh, and, and like the gold rush, a lot of the people making all the money, the ones selling the shovels, you know, you, uh, I, I've, I've, I can't think of another time that's more disruptive than right now. I mean, we're seeing uh, the biggest, most powerful markets ever being so disrupted, like music, you know, movies, transportation, TV, yeah. transportation, hotels, like hotel that, business. Yeah. Like these are established, like they've got their roots deep and they've got their hands in the pockets of politicians and they're fucked. They're absolutely screwed. The taxi cab, taxi cab industry is just it getting doesn't decimated. Exist anymore. No. <laughs> it's insane, and this these are these are some of the most. Although Sal, Sal and I, I don't miss it either. We did get in a taxi cab. This we were down in L.A. for the L.A. Fit Expo. Last time I ever do it, and we got into oh, it. We, we got we got in a taxi. It was cab. right there. What an asshole I was though, because I'm asking him like Uber questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so used to using Uber now that. Well, I, how long have you been driving yeah. for Uber? Like, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, could, you could tell he was totally offended by it, too, because I guess he had left and actually tried to do Uber for a while and then went back to driving for a, uh, for the taxi cabs. Before, for him, he, he made the, the claim that it was much, uh, much more difficult for him to build a full time service than it was to work for another company. Yeah, I imagine so. And, and that's just like a, um, you know, that's just a hazard, I guess, of, of trying to quote, disrupt shit is that some people lose out and that's unfortunate right right mm-hmm. what now what companies i'd love to hear from you since you geek out on stuff like what's fascinating you right now yeah. do you have specific companies you love to watch to see what, what they're do doing we need to look out for well i love the youtube stars these guys even if i don't like his content i love seeing logan paul just disrupt things and and break wow. stuff oh he's been all over the place lately i he's love this guy right i now. love seeing how these media like so Casey Neistat spoke at HustleCon, one of our events, and mm-hmm. like it's just so crazy that this one guy has more clout than um, a, a CNN, so, a celebrity, right? Yeah, and when uh, Trump did the the ban from um, Iran and Syria and, and the, the the five or six country ban, Casey Neistat filmed did a thing on um, on the some of the folks who were being banned in NY in in the JFK in the airport. And I thought that his this one person did a better job of explaining some of this information than CNN did. Wow. And so that was incredibly interesting hmm. to me. So I think that these YouTube guys are, I think that they are really going to change what a, they might replace a lot of media companies. Oh, I think we're seeing it happen. Yeah. Right. I think it's fascinating to see all these guys falling right now. Are you watching all these celebrities? It seems like every day we have a new one that's getting busted. The Hollywood ones. Yeah, yeah, you can't do bad shit anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You already got to hide it really, really good because yeah. one person has a big loud voice and every if you do something wrong everyone will know i know right? yeah. well st- talking of youtube you were saying something you mentioned uh and we moved on but i want to go back to it like uh that uh, youtube is starting to regulate more and what do you see happening in the future of that like are, you think it's going to be just as fucked as facebook and is it challenging what do you oh, think well yeah that's this is just like you just I, I just love looking at numbers just look at i mean it's just a supply and demand thing right if you like facebook has so many users that they have this new thing called internet.org where they put in you can look this up where they put these huge gliders over india and they transport free internet yep. to these uh folks who are uh, in awesome. poverty and can't afford internet yeah. because facebook says look uh, we have so many users on on facebook right now that literally the only people who are on facebook are the ones who don't have internet so we're going to give them in- free internet because it makes sense for us Ooh. Yeah. so like market solution right <laughs> and it's just a supply and demand thing you need more eyeballs need more <laughs> page views whatever so youtube inevitably yes it will go through this and it is going through this i mean this is what like ethan at h3h3 complains about all the time i don't know if you guys follow him but he's a i don't U- tell us he's just a, a, a youtube uh comedian but they're starting to get more serious about how and casey and i said and logan paul i think all these people i've heard them all talk about demonetization on youtube and how they're getting pissed off that uh youtube isn't uh treating their creators properly mm-hmm. so yes YouTube is going through this at the moment, and and it will continue to do that. Wow. So when the whole net neutrality thing was going on, that must have been big news with you guys and your and your readers. Yes, it was. I think I think our readers, our audience, our community is more interested in like um, a little bit more business oriented than mm-hmm. net neutrality. Right now, everyone cares about crypto. I mean, that's just like uh, yeah. the hottest oh, that's thing a big going. One, yeah. 
Um, I'm so sick of hearing about crypto. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> talks about it, but um, that's like that was that's way bigger than the net neutrality. But net neutrality was quite large. Um, and also uh, the Uber, Uber, um, what they're going through is a big deal with our audience. And Amazon just taking over the world is mm-hmm, huge too. Mm-hmm. What's going on with Uber when you you brought them up a couple times? Or um, well, so about a year ago or maybe half a year ago, the CEO got always getting in trouble, right? <laughs> yeah, he, well, he got forced out. Um, the guy who started it got forced out because he, um, well, uh, he did a lot of things or he was accused of a lot of things. But um, whether it's true or not, his his image was that he was like pretty much a smug asshole. Mm. Um, so he got kicked out and then he just sold like uh, three or three billion dollars worth of his shares the other day, and, which is like huge, new, big news. What? Who knows what's, what he's going to do with it? Mm-hmm. And this guy's like kind of crazy. And, and <laughs> he's going to start the next one. How important yeah. do you think image is now for a CEO of a big company like that? Unfortunately, it's huge. Because right. yeah. um, Uber's not even a publicly traded company. You know, it's a private company. Mm. It's different when you... when. How you're, fucked is that? You have a private company you built up and you get fucking you get exited. Pushed out. <laughs> yeah, you get, it's yeah. the worst. Right? It's got to be a like, motherfucker. I've put my foot in my mouth like, I'm not I'm a nobody and even I have put my foot in, in my mouth and it's crazy that you just have to be aware of your public perception it's mm. so important and you know most of the people who are starting companies nowadays are just computer nerds like myself we're just like nerds who started shit behind our computer screen in kitchen like like for a lot of people the goal is not to be like famous a cool right, guy right, right, or like right. popular like you just became cool on accident well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you become cool, but you certainly become loud. You certainly have three, a, a larger platform. Three billion dollars makes anybody cool. Oh yeah. So uh, <laughs> how works. did you how did you start this? Like, like take us back uh, yeah. to when you, which is one that long ago, right? When did you? No, when did you start our this company off? is pretty new. Our product is about twenty months old, but we were we changed what we did early on. But basically. Uh, so I'm from Missouri. Uh, I went to school in Nashville, Tennessee on an athletic scholarship. So I'm I'm familiar with uh, all these all this awesome gear you guys out here. What sport? Well, yeah, what sport? I was play? a 400 meter runner. Oh wow, oh, awesome! You yeah. got the fast switch muscle fibers. Uh, yes, but it, it also makes it easy to get fat. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you stop running, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was an athlete there, and then I met a guy named Mike Wolf. Um, have you guys seen that TV show American Pickers? No. Oh, I have. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, where they go into the uh, Is the guy pick with a beard or the other guy? The other guy. Okay. The skinny one. The skinny one, yeah. And I met him on the street of Nashville because I was a huge fan, and he offered me a job at his at his store where we sold junk, basically. Right. And do, in doing that, I learned what an entrepreneur was. Um, my parents are entrepreneurs, but I didn't really put... I didn't really care about that when I was a kid. But anyway, um, I, I threw this guy. He taught me how you could start a business. And I ended up launching um, a hot dog stand in Nashville, Tennessee called Southern Sam's. Wiener's as big as a baby's arm. On your own? On your own? Wiener's yeah, so as big I, as a baby's I, arm. I, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So That's I, quit, I quit working for him and I started a, a chain of hot... It ended up becoming like a chain of hot dog stands. Shut up. And how old are you? Oh, awesome. I was um, maybe 20. Oh, fuck yeah. Okay. 19. And so you have... How many stands do you have at this point? Just a couple, but I had spots all over town. And so, like, during the day, you're in the good spot. You're, like, uh, in one spot. And then in the evening, you're where the drunk people are. And you double your prices. I know a guy that did did very well doing that. Brilliant. He would set up right at all downtown San Jose where all the nightclubs. And he would work from, mm-hmm. like, 10 to 4 a.m. and just rake in. Man. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah. can kill it on some days. You know, I could walk home with, like, two Gs in cash. Yes. Oh, shit. Um, other days, it might be, like, a hundred bucks, yeah. but right. other days it could be like two grand, you know, <laughs> yeah. and now it's like a big deal. But it was, it's really hard work. It's physically demanding, especially right, right. in Nashville when it's 110 degrees some days. Oh, it's really hard. And so I was like, there's got to be a better way to like make a living. This is so like physically challenging. <laughs> like I'm sunburned all the time. And so I ended up starting an online liquor store called Moonshine Online where we sold um, uh, whiskey, white whiskey. It's not really moonshine, but we called it that. Wow. Um, and so I was like, oh, the internet's way better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I ended up uh, way less physically demanding. Yeah, it's yeah. way easier. So I, I left school a little early, moved out to San Francisco because I just Googled it and they said that all the internet companies are in San Francisco. And I met a guy and he had this idea for a roommate matching company. So I joined him and we kind of built that up. And then after like uh, 11 or 10 months, it got acquired. And so after it got acquired, I was like, all right, what should I do next? And so I ended up starting HustleCon, which was a conference for entrepreneurs. And I was like, I'll just put this little thing on and hopefully it will. I'll meet someone or it'll, it'll lead to some type of inspiration um, for starting my next big thing. And I did this conference and unexpectedly about 360 people came and it made a whole lot of money and profit. 
And I was like, that, I didn't expect that to happen. That's oh, kinda, how do you do that? That's, that's just like it. Lewis Howe's story with LinkedIn. I don't know if you know his story. Yeah. Very, very similar. similar. I mean, he was one of the first guys in LinkedIn to like make a name for himself. And then he just started Setting up hold, these conferences. Yes, yeah, set up these little conferences. So, and he was like so, blown away by what he was able to make off of it. So you sold the one business and did you make good money off that? Did you make a little bit of money to set you up? Is that what you used No, to? not a lot. Okay. Enough that I didn't have to work for a little bit. Okay. No, not a lot. No, I, I, I sold that. Did you go buy a Lambo or anything like that? No, I rode my <laughs> motorcycle across the country for about 80 days and chill. That's what I did. Oh, cool. Well, that Very cool. Awesome. That's so, fucking yeah. cool, though. Yeah. So, so you, so you do that. You start uh, Hustlecom, and it's an idea for a conference. Where do you find these people? Like, how does this all start? Because one of the hardest things to to uh, for people to understand about entrepreneurship is, uh, or one of the biggest questions I should say is, how do I get started? Like, what do I do first? Yeah, I learned from a very early age that you just make shit up. And if you act confident, people will follow along. And most of the time, if you're smart, you'll figure it out. I hate to say it, but that's, that's exactly what it is. It's like our MO. Yeah, right. you'll figure it out. That's the, the jump out of a plane with no... like you figure out how to make the pressure right, right. on the way down. Right, yeah, right. you'll figure it out. Like, yeah. you kind of figure it out and just act confident and people will believe that you'll know and you'll figure it out most of the time. Sometimes you don't. But yeah. anyway, um, I just like... Would eat. I had like 16 people in mind who I wanted to invite, and I just l- kind of lied to them, and I told each one that the other 15 were coming, and thankfully it worked out to where most <laughs> oh of them said gosh. yes. So I was like, it's not a lie. It, uh, it's like, <laughs> as long as it works, it's not a lie. And so I did that, and they said yes, and, and then I also knew a little bit about... I was a, I'm a self-taught copywriter. I'm not very good, but I understand how it works. And I knew email was powerful. And so I started a newsletter. That's what I did. And so in about seven weeks, it made like 60 Gs in profit. And, wow. um, and 360 people came. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's crazy that that worked. I didn't expect that to work. And so I did it again after about six months. And this time I called my co-founder from my old company. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, John, come do this thing with me. It might work. I don't know what's going on, but maybe something's here. And then this time it made like a quarter of a million bucks nearly oh, shit. in like 80 days, 82 days. Wow. And we did the exact same thing of email. And then throughout this period, I had I read the biography of Ted Turner. He's the guy who started CNN. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's kind of a cool life. And that's like, you're kind of doing stuff on culture. That's really neat. Like he, they covered, CNN covered the first Iraq war in 1990 and they had some pretty revolutionary coverage around it. And I read all about it. I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. You really put a stamp on the world. That's cool. But then I saw the average Fox News and the average CNN age was like 70 years old. And I was like, oh, well, there's <laughs> clearly opportunity here. There's like, uh, you know, hundreds. Very smart. Yeah. I mean, there's like a big opportunity. There's like 100 million millennials in America, most of which are college educated. Mm-hmm. There's a market here. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. I don't even know how it's going to make money, but there's something is going on here. And so we were like, my co-founder and I were like, look, if we're good enough to create content to convince these strangers to come to our event, like people flew in from Dubai, from uh, Nigeria, from uh, Asia, all over the world. Maybe we can like make this bigger. And at the time, Business Insider had just sold for five hundred million bucks. Vice had just raised a whole bunch of money at like a five or six billion dollar valuation, just a lot of money. And we're like, if they did it, we could probably figure this out. So we, on um, in August of two years ago, we launched the hustle. And the idea was like a Business Insider meets a Vice type of blog. And so mm-hmm. we did these articles where, like. We did like crazy, crazy articles, like where I had a friend who would basically write books on how to get laid, and he made like sixty Gs a month on Kindle. And I thought yeah. that, and but but he told me about it where he basically just like ripped off, like copied other people's works, and like sent it to the Philippines for a guy to just like slightly change the words, and then he bought like a fake or not a fake, but he bought a dumb sexy cover and named it some stupid thing and then had people review it that he paid like five like wow. fake reviews and then he would make like 30 50 oh 60 God, G's a month doing this. Wow. and i was like that is so shady like, yeah, it's very shady. Uh, uh, i was like so we wrote about it and we yeah. talked about it and then the next week what we did was we had my co-founder he was doing this whole time he uh uh, we f- we realized that the most volatility in the Kindle market was romance novels and so we had him become a best-selling romance novelist by doing this guy's method Wow. Did it work? No it worked. Oh Shut the fuck God. up. Are you serious? Captivating Claire by John Havel. It worked. Wow. Wow. And he made money. He made good money off of that. It made a little bit of money, but it got to number one. And so these all these like fake so authors. He's a number were, one author or whatever. Exactly. There's a formula cause, there. Because all these authors were like, I'm a bestseller. We're like, what's that mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How hard is that yeah. really? How yeah. did you get there? So he became a best selling author of a uh, romance novelist. And then anyway, we did like these crazy blog posts like this. And it did well. It got mm. millions of views. But we're like, the, 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 
the economics of this is really challenging. Like not that people, not that many people are going to go to your website every day, and it's hard to make money that way. Mm-hmm. And so on April twentieth, so four twenty of uh, two, it'll be two years this April. We said, look, email only worked for um, HustleCon, and you guys know the website Thrillist. They mm-hmm. Thrillist.com. Yeah, it's I like know. a travel and oh, okay. Uh, yes, a, yes, yes. It's huge. It's like a maybe a billion dollar company now. It's called Group Nine. It's a big thing. They own now this. It's just a big like conglomerate type of deal. Anyway, they started as email only as well, and we were like, "Well, if those guys did it, like, and we're pretty good at that, what if we just did that?" And so, uh, yeah, twenty months ago, what's that? About twenty months ago now, we switched to email only, and since then, the numbers just kind of blew up. So you guys celebrate four twenty differently now. Forever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, or, the yes. yeah. Yeah. or the same. Yeah, he's had that moment. D- different reason to celebrate, but the same way. <laughs> <laughs> right. What What are some of the do's and don'ts? Uh, in email? What have you learned yourself and seen during this whole process of building this email business? Um, let's see. Some things that happened early on that I, I tell people to know early on, uh, uh, tell people when they're starting now is basically, you know how you do like a double opt-in for emails? Mm-hmm. Yeah, get rid of that. Don't do that. You'll you'll increase your subscriptions by like thirty percent. Wow. wow! So when someone enters their email, you know how it says like now click this thing. Just get rid of that. Um, what else? Um, treat email as its own platform. So a lot of people just treat their email as like an RSS reader, where right, basically or just like, mirroring sh- something. Yeah, I think that's silly. Hmm. I don't think you should do that. Um, a, a few other things were like your welcome email and your confirmation page after someone subscribes. Those are really, really, really important. Those are really great opportunities to be different. A lot of times people just use the generic like, you welcome, just subscribe, click yeah. this. Yeah, it's just like the basic stuff that they don't think to change or the subscribe page or even the unsubscribe page. They just make it the same thing. If you make those like on brand for us, it was kind of humorous and funny. Um, people will love it. You have a very similar style like your voice when I read your stuff as we do. Give some examples of that and your the uh, subjects, even the stuff how you sign off on it, the fir- I mean talk about some of those things. Yeah, so voice is really important with us. So like uh it's not the welcome email anymore. It's the it's the subscriber page after you subscribe, but when we first launched it was like the welcome email, the headline was uh or the subject line was look what you did, you little jerk. And it said like, uh, you know, you can read it. If you Google the hustles welcome email, there's like 12 blogs who have written about this. But basically, uh, oh, there it is. There it is. I assure you, we don't take what just happened lightly. And it's a whole page about how all these people in our office, like Kara just took a whole bunch of shots of tequila because she's so pumped you just signed up. <laughs> or like, <laughs> That's so cool. Right yeah. outside and uh, hugged a stranger. Like, it's like a long thing, uh, which a lot of people wouldn't like think. This is all these things that just happened. Right, yeah. and a lot of people wouldn't think that this would work because it's like kind of long form, but it does. It works really well. Now, I also noticed spacing, the size of it. Are these all things that, are, that you take into consideration also? 100%. So uh, if you don't, if you're just starting to get into writing, I say, I tell people try to keep sentences below 25 words and keep sentence uh, paragraphs three sentences or less. Hmm. Um, it, it makes the readability uh, in- increases the readability. It does um, remove um, needless words. Try not to use too many adverbs. Um, write at like a sixth grade reading level, and you could do that by going to HemingwayApp.com. And- oh shit! I should be good Ooh. for this. Then we should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you should do all of our writing. Yeah, all right, we'll do we and will. So the irony of all this, why I was so excited to have you here, is we actually built this thing uh, without using email whatsoever. It was probably one of the biggest mistakes that we ever did. <laughs> yeah. Was we were so do that, focused kids. on the content and providing as much free good content to our people, and the podcast was the main source of that. That once we woke up one day and said, "Oh shit, we got a million plus downloads a month of people listening to us." You know, how do we reach them and touch them on a regular basis? And sure, we're on social media platforms. We really had kind of dropped the ball on email, and we just started really capturing emails this past year. And we haven't even put in place any sort of sequencing or anything. Yeah, so sequencing is great. My buddy Neville, who's a big email guy, he calls them uh, his little his little slaves because basically he creates a sequence one time and they go to work for him all the time. So basically if one person subscri- subscribes, you have a drip sequence and you know by like sequence five or by email five that 30% of people will buy whatever he's selling. Hmm. So then you just get a bunch of people to sign up for the email. Then you got yourself a machine. Right. Hmm. Do you think a lot of people overthink those sequences and maybe like, cause you're just saying sixth grade reading level. I mean, keeping it. Well, sim- they definitely over, 
they 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 think too much about the writing. You know, the writing is incredibly important, but like a lot of people use jargon or they'll say like, oh, like they'll talk like you know, like resume talk, like I ensure that we hit goal. Yeah. yeah. Or like uh like they just use jargon. It's like you don't know, when have you ever said ensure? <laughs> <laughs> like I made yeah. sure we did this. Just say that. Just talk like write like you speak. Mm. And they, That's what I noticed is that it's like I'm listening to someone talk to me rather than reading Exactly. Yeah. It's like and it's like that people like automatically assume that that's unprofessional. It's like that's not unprofessional. If I met the president, I would be like, "Mr. President, how are you? It's great to see you." I wouldn't be like, "Hello, sir. Like, what's yeah. going on? How? Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. like, or well, I would even say, "What's up to the president?" And if like, you, sir, what's up? It's great to see you. And if you, you think about I it, everybody's you. everybody's on text so much. It's so important that it's changing the way we read, uh, like copy. Whereas before, there was a very professional. You go back thirty years. You wrote a certain way and you read a certain way. We're but now because emojis now. Yeah, now we're so used to text. Like, if, if it's almost like this is more personal. I believe this more than the super, you know, kind of regimented type of writing. And whatever. we call that the John Stewart effect. My buddy made up that phrase that we use now, which <laughs> basically we are silly and funny yet intelligent. And but because we're, um, because we write in a relatable tone, people trust us more. Mm-hmm. Kind of like when John Stewart would like you know, make jokes and shit, but he was actually incredibly intelligent. Mm-hmm, so like mm-hmm. you trust him a lot more because he's like, Oh, you're kind of self deprecating. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. And like Slack text messenger. I mean, like you spend most of your time email, you spend most of your time in the text world. Get good at, get good at that. Mm. Right. Yeah. Do you, now with your, uh, how do you guys monetize with this? Is it a fee to subscribe or is it no. because you've got, okay. So we make, you know, we're, we grew, we're at close to 20 full-time people now. Um, so it grew quickly and it's very, it makes good money and 100%, not 100%, 90% of the revenue is made through advertisements in the email. Oh, wow. And so in the same way that HuffPo or Business Insider, you see advertisements on the website, we had, a, we built our whole own. It's literally no different. It's no different. It's just in an email. The only difference is, is that we had to build all of our own stuff. So that stuff you see on Business Insider, it's technology that's like third party technology that like you just plug in it's like boom you just are making money that didn't exist for email so we had to build it all we built it all ourselves hmm. uh, are you impacting and helping a lot of people do you get a lot of messages from people saying man you totally yeah if we like tell people to respond and we say like hey like let us know what you think about this thing or this thing we'll get thousands and thousands of replies in one day on a normal day we'll get uh you know hundreds of replies of just people reaching out or we'll get people mailing us stuff or just showing up at the office of it could be small. Like I, like you made me sound more intelligent when I was interviewing for this position and I was able to shoot the shit with this guy who was interviewing me and it kind of built rapport and I got a job. Uh, other times it's like, uh, you inspired me. Now I just started a company. Like we've had people who have come to our conferences and they've started huge companies and they've recently sold them. It's like, we just created, helped create like a generation of wealth for this person. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, that's pretty cool. So it changes and it could, or it could just be like, I was bummed today and you just made me a little happier. So it's, yeah, we get all that, we get that type of stuff all the time. It's cool. Do you guys have a way for uh, connecting like the subscribers besides like your, your events that you do sort of live and in person? Yeah. So we have about 4,000 ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who has uh, gotten a unique URL and gotten their friends to join the hustle. And we have a, a Facebook group where they hang out and we have a lot of really cool investors like Tim Ferriss or, uh, the guys who started Bleacher Report and all these really cool companies, and we'll have them do live question and answer sessions in the Facebook group. So mm. we talk to that, that's like where our most loyal folks will um, hang out. Um, and then we're expanding to other types of content, so we'll be able to talk to them throughout the day soon. Um, but right now, it's uh, besides live events and email, our company is like so simple. A lot of people are surprised that it does what it does just off that, but that's yeah. pretty much what it is. Yeah, God, it's, it's that was a so kiss simple. simple. Yeah, I love uh, it, kiss, though. keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, with with your events, you get you do them once a year. How big? Do well, they get? we we do a couple other ones. Oh, you do. Okay. We do. We have this one called Two X, and it's basically what it's like to succeed, and all about the strug- struggle from females in the um, tech world and entrepreneurial world. And so we'll we do that in L.A. and San Francisco, and we, we've got some coming up in Chicago, New York, and Austin, and. We'll do those, and we'll have like we did when the one in San Francisco. We had we sold close to a thousand tickets in like twenty four hours. Wow! So that one's more of a female centric, yeah, type of that deal. That one's female centric. And so, what do they get when they go there? Are there like booths, or is it speakers and and? Um, so I'm from, or I moved here from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a huge music fan. I studied music business, and so the whole idea early on was like let's take let's try to make it as exciting as a concert. And so they're all most nearly every one of our big events is done in like a, a music venue or something that feels like a theater, 
a theater music venue. Um, and so it's typically like a like a talk. Oh, okay. Uh, we do have like booths and stuff like that, but it's more like a, a show as opposed to a trade show. Oh, okay. And then what about your hustle? Is it called HustleCon? HustleCon. Con, excuse Conference. me. What, what, is, what is that one all about? So that's at the Paramount in Oakland. We had close to 3,000 people show up last wow. year. Wow. Um, and yeah, Casey Neistat there. Who Casey else? Neistat. So we've had all types of cool people. So we've had Casey Neistat, the guy who started Bonobos, the founder of Pandora, um, the founder of Away Travel. We've had um, the guy. How about this one? The guy who started a men's warehouse. You know, like you're gonna like the way yeah. that guy. Oh, shit. Yeah. That guy. Founder of Chubby's. Founders of Casper. Oh wow, uh, you had some great ones. Um, who was most interesting? Um, the guy uh, Miguel, the founder of WeWork. He was probably the most interesting. Casey was cool. Tom from... Uh, oh, Tom Bilyeu? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was interesting. Buddy of ours? Yeah, he was cool. Um, yeah, Casey was interesting. Hanging out with him for the... like, Or just talking to him for a little while was 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 pretty interesting. Have you, so I'm curious to hear from you because we noticed something uh, when we interview or talk to like these you know, YouTube type celebrities. They tend to be very different than the mm-hmm. personality they have on the show. Did you find that at all? With... Tom, I did. Tom was like so personal and just like, just like a guy hanging out. But right. then when people were surrounding him, he was like this inspiration. He turns, he turns it on, on, right? Yeah. He turns it on yeah. hard for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, Casey was very hyper. And I'd like, I'd be like, Casey, pay attention to me. Here's your microphone. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, oh, look, a flashlight. And like, would shine the flashlight in his eye. And then he was like, oh, a piece of, if you watch the, the talk, he's got like duct tape on his leg because in the back, he like he's like oh look at this tape and like he started tearing it just like sticking on it on his legs, and I was like Casey <laughs> look at me I need you to pay attention please look at me <laughs> squirrel yeah. and so yeah that's exactly what it was so he was like way more hyper than you when I would have I find a lot of them are like that because it takes this kind of different personality to to get on this camera and look at it pretend like you're talking to millions of people with all this energy right yeah I find that we're they're a lot different I, I also think it's just on, entrepreneurs in general tend to be a little bit. I don't know, a little different. I mean, you're you're obviously an entrepreneur, kind of the prototype. Do you find some like that you see certain characteristics kind of are similar between entrepreneurs? Yeah, well, I think to most of the time to have extreme success, it typically takes an extreme personality, mm-hmm. um, and it's a struggle. I mean, um, hell, I I just came here from my therapy, so like, <laughs> right. like so it's like there are it's fucking hard to do this shit and it's stressful every single day and it makes you weird Mm. so i don't know if you start weird or if it makes you weird that's cool that you admit that i was going to ask you because you refer to yourself as a nerd a few times but you actually seem to have this really outgoing personality has that been something that you've you've developed over time no it's gone the other way so i i feel as though i was very outgoing but now i'm way more introverted so i am pretty outgoing but but at the same time um I don't drink alcohol. I don't do drugs. And so when I'm not working, I just like to be at home and I don't like doing anything. I don't like being around anyone. Like really quiet and stuff. Yeah, because I get enough... um, Of this. Well, (laughs) not like this, but like people messaging you on, on Facebook or tweeting at you or emailing you. I don't want... I don't want to talk to people because I need to like turn off my brain. I actually find yeah. that very common. I think that's we all would agree we're the same way too. When you mm-hmm. talk for a living and you're constantly interacting with hundreds, sometimes thousands of people... When I go home, I just want to shut off completely. Yeah. And it's like once you like, let's say that you want a lot of money in life. And once you like get a little money, you're like, oh, OK, that's cool. Uh, what else is there? Like, you know what I mean? And it's almost like that with attention. So like you get it's like, oh, I wanted a lot of attention. And then you start getting attention. You're like, oh, right. I was uh, I've been in and out of therapy my entire life as a seven year old. My my real father committed suicide. My mother married into an abusive relationship. So I'm uh, no stranger to uh, going to therapy whatsoever. Was that something that you just recently started in your adulthood or is it something you've been doing for a long time? Um, I've always been when I was seven, in seventh grade, I read how to win friends and influence people. So I was always like kind of weird about like understanding <laughs> my own emotions and like how to like manipulate in a positive way, but ma- manipulate other people's emotions to like feel good about themselves or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I've always been weird about that. And I've always uh, had like depression and, and anxiety issues. So I've always been, I think that I'm a little neurotic and just high strung and like very aggressive. And that's kind of made me succeed in a lot of ways. But it's also like, just makes me a little nutty, like a little high, high, you know, just like wound tight. Yeah. Um, and I also, um, 
Um, I feel like weed would be so good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hate weed. Really? I don't, no. I don't do any drugs. I, do I know. I heard you say that. I thought, God, that's yeah, why don't you, such yeah. a good one so for you. You've obviously tried it. Does April, it you don't you think it's serendipitous? It makes me, it makes April paranoid. 20th is such a great day for dude, you, too. Dude, it's you had a, the wrong strain. It, this this yeah. is common when you get, uh, first off, anxiety is, uh, is uh, strongly correlated with high intelligence. And oh, I'll, thanks. It, yeah. It's, yeah, see maybe, how he, yeah. It's actually, no, this is a real statistic. You up, yeah. And uh, marijuana, I found that certain people, especially very smart people, just get more like, they start to analyze themselves even more and get really paranoid. Is that what happens to you? I hate it, yes. Okay. I've like smoked very few times in my whole life. Mm. Um, and when I have, I'm like, I'm never doing that again. That was, <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't like to fly either. I try never to fly. And it's the same thing. It's like you're in a thing and you can't get out if you wanted to get out. Uh, it's the control. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. like, that freaks me out. Yeah. It's so much. And so I don't do that um, at all. And also I get addicted to shit. So I, I don't. You know that about your personality already? Yeah. So I don't. I, <laughs> what, I are some, what are some smart. things you've been addicted to? Well, alcohol. Oh, okay. For sure. So oh, I don't. I don't know that. I, it took me. It was. Uh, I, I had to get off that. And that was a huge deal. So when did you realize that? How long were you? It's been about five years. Okay. So I, w- I just kind of went wild between ages like 19 and like 22. No, 19 and 23. Okay. Hmm. And I just tend to, whenever I'm into something, it's all I ever think about. And it's all I ever want. Mm-hmm. And so I just like, well, so I'll, I'll do it as much as I can. I just get obsessed with it. So I, I try my hardest to only get obsessed with healthy things. For a long time, it was sugar. That was my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, sugar. I, I just love sugar. Like M&M's, I just eat so much of it. Or just like whipped cream. Oh, whipped cream? Yeah. Or, <laughs> very specific. Right? Yeah. It's just like, because that's like a way that you can consume a lot of sugar and it doesn't fill you up. I just uh. love that shit. Or like, <laughs> right now it's Coke Zero. Uh, that's, that's my obsession. Uh, For a long time, it was watermelon. I just get obsessed with like certain types of food, particularly sugar-based That's food. Funny. That's <laughs> funny. So through this process with the therapist and knowing this about yourself and you're not a drug guy, are you somebody, have you found other things to help mm-hmm. you with that? Like, do you meditate? Do you finally yeah. read? Do you travel? Like, what are the things that help this create balance for you? Well, so like I, the unfortunate part is that most of those things that give you that immediate dopamine rush are bad for you. So drugs and alcohol. Uh, sex could do it, but it's not as immediate. And running does it, but it takes like 20 minutes to like really get those endorphins going. <laughs> you know what I mean? With alcohol, you just take a shot and you feel it. Mm-hmm. So running has helped. I, I'm a runner. Um, so that has helped. Um, I do meditation every morning. Um, sugar was un- unfortunately my thing for a while, but I'm trying to stop that. Um, uh, in reading, reading biographies has been like a real drug. Um mm. That's like I'm. I get pretty obsessive about certain types of people, and I will. I will just like research and learn everything I can about them. And Any favorites in the last year or two? Joseph Kennedy, okay. uh, JFK's father. Oh. He's super interesting because at age 24, he said, "I'm going to get so wealthy that all of my kids, I'm going to have, a, I'm going to have a fuck ton of kids, and all of them are going to be so wealthy that all they're going to be able to do is be in government because I've already taken care of money." And that's exactly what happened. Wow. And so basically, JF, J- J- Joseph Kennedy was interesting because he basically made modern a lot of people don't know this he made modern hollywood hollywood so like back then there was a whole bunch of issues where they were like oh we don't trust these jews you know like it was a lot of anti-semitism and he was a white guy and so basically he kind of came in and changed shit and then spielsberg came in and yeah and, and, <laughs> and changed right it, all. It, it was basically a ton of anti-semitic thought mm. and he took advantage of that because he was a he looked like me he was a blonde haired white guy that people happened to trust even though he was incredibly unethical and really shady oh he, really he was yeah he was a, not a he was very unethical and he was not a good guy in some sense of the word uh, some sense of that but anyway he um and he also um helped delay world war ii um and so he was very uh had his hands in culture and that's why i find him to be incredibly mm-hmm. interesting are you ever worried because you you get into things you really get into them and then you seem to move on do you ever get worried you can get bored with what you're doing now and you have to do something else worried no but i embrace that, mm-hmm. that that's my thing no, I'm not worried about that. But I don't really get bored about it with it with shit too easily, I guess. I mean, I get up like I'm obsessed with business and making money, and so I don't think I'll ever get bored of that. Maybe I'll get bored of a ter- certain type of mm. of like business unit. But the cool thing about media and what we do is there's like lots of different business units in it, mm-hmm. or there can be at least. How, how do you see Sam? How do you see business evolving in the future for us? Like, what are we in the middle of right now, and what do you? How do you think things? I mean, to me, being someone who's 36, 
I already saw the difference. I didn't have a Facebook. I didn't have an Instagram. I didn't have any social media because that wasn't that cool when I was a kid growing up. I did, I did without it. I actually had built successful businesses without it. But now it's like a necessity, right? Yeah. So what do you, what do you see now and where do you see us going? Well, in my small world of Silicon Valley, um, I don't know how involved you guys are with that, but in my small side of the world of this whole Silicon Valley venture capital type of thing, money is flowing freely. Money is good. Anyone with a any idiot with an idea can get a million bucks. Uh, same thing with this crypto thing. Anyone with that puts ICO next to something, it's going to be huge. Mm. Um, that's going to change in the next decade for sure. And so what I think is going to happen is like these guys who think that they can get a five million dollar valuation off just an idea and raise a million bucks, or sometimes a ten million dollar valuation just off of like a stupid idea of like let's say, have you guys seen H- HQ? That trivia game. Mm-mm. Okay, it's like Jeopardy, but it's basically just a guy. It's, it's it's cool, but anyway, it's just like a, a trivia game that you'll you'll see it. It's everywhere now. Anyway, they raised money at a hundred million dollar valuation, and it's only been around <laughs> for six months. And they have a lot of users. They have a million users. They've only been around for six months. But I mean, where's the business? Yeah, what is it? Where is the business? And it's only six months old. And anyway, a hundred million dollars? Fuck no. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> that type of shit happens all the time. How, why though? Why is that happening right now? Well, because just because there could a bunch of VCs that are just excited to give all these Silicon Valley out? kids yeah. fucking money. Is that yeah? Why? But that's how it works. You only need one Facebook to re- to return a whole fund. And so basically, that's how the game works. It's just right now, wallets are looser. So like, we could have hated on we when Instagram got bought. A lot of people thought it was the stupidest thing ever, and now they make a uh, probably I don't know. They probably make fifteen billion bucks a year, and they were bought for a billion dollars. That's a great deal, right? But they there's just like now people are just making lots of bets like that. So the strategy kind of works. It just won't work like. A lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand that a venture capitalist is going to make a hundred bets, and only really like three or four of them actually need to work in order to make a fuck ton of money. Right? Mm-hmm. Like they don't understand that like one investment is going to thousand x, and all the rest are going to die. And a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand that. That look like this, you're only one of a hundred to this guy. You're not yeah. important necessarily to him. Um, and so, but they think that they are the one, and they're and they could be the one. But anyway, the thing that's going to happen, I think, is that. Profitability is going to matter real soon once the markets mm-hmm. go down. De- once the markets go to shit, which they inevitably they will. There'll be some kind of correction, right? Right, and and it, they will. And people are not going to make a ten thousand x like off Bitcoin. That mm-hmm. shit's not going to happen all the time. Yeah. And you're going to have to have fundamentally sound companies, um, which people do not have right now. Right. Many mm-hmm. people do not have. And so I believe that's the the in my world of venture capital and technology that is going to change uh, probably. Definitely in a decade, probably way sooner than that. Well, I so, would think it would favor a guy like you, though, because you guys tend to have a very well-oiled machine right now. It's we gonna, make profits. Right. Yes, mm-hmm. it's good for us. And and I understand the idea behind some of that. You know, with a big business, a restaurant, it'll take a year to make back your money. If you, you know, a restaurant in San Francisco, that probably takes a million dollars. I get that. And, it ta- and you won't make that back for a while. I understand. I understand that. But many of these companies who are raising large, large rounds, I don't think will ever make anything. Mm-hmm. And I think that is... That the, will change. The hype. The hype is so big right now. Right. Have you ever gotten into a conversation with someone about ICOs? No. Oh, yeah. No. Do you know about ICOs? No. Okay. Explain. An ICO is a... Okay. This I'm going to sound like an idiot explaining it, but this is how people believe it. And it is kind of true, but an ICO is a, a, a initial coin offering. So these companies create their own coins, their mm. own crypto coins. Right. And then people buy them oh. and... They hope to trade them. It's basically like stock, but they want these coins to be like currency. But basically, you have all these like basically the guys who used to live in like Las Vegas and like post photos of them with money and cars. They got into this world because they're like, "Fuck, we can tr- we can basically get all of these. We can tell these people we have this amazing technology and get them to buy all these coins and then pump oh it up. God. It's like penny stocks. Pump it up and then but, sell it, and yeah. then sell it, and then they're left with it. And who cares? Yeah, pump yeah. and dump is happening dump, big yeah. time with it's uh, pump with and dumps. So this is exactly what it is. Right. And I do think that there is some great technology in there. And right, there right. are some real folks in there. There's just a lot of charlatans, and it's mm. and it's if you. <laughs> Go and look at some of these big ICOs and Google the founders and look at their Instagram and you can kind of tell. You, I want the person who looks disgusting and like an alien to be doing like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't want like a good looking guy to be yeah, crushing this. Yeah, yeah. Right. And like, his Ferrari and shit, right? right. Yeah, yeah, that, that guy is not the guy I want to be doing this. I want the guy to like have like 
like spaghetti stains on his t-shirt because yeah. <laughs> he's in a the lazy fucking computer all day. right because he like doesn't leave his room i want him to have like shit under his eyes because he hasn't yeah. slept i don't want him to be good looking and i don't want him to talk about how yeah. fit he is and i don't want to see his abs if he has abs i'm not doing it he's working his ass off for that right 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 and yeah. so basically what's going on is you have all these people with these icos and it's gonna fail really it's anytime all- anytime you have an emerging market that's exploding you have a bunch of shit that comes along with it and eventually right. it clears out and then the winners right and the famous joe the famous or one of my favorite joe kennedy stories is he's like look anytime that he goes he pulled his money out of the markets during the great or right before the great depression started because they were in a bull market right before that and he goes the shoe shine boy gave me advice on which stock to buy and at that point i go yeah this is not a good idea i gotta get out of this there's too much hype Wow. I, I've heard that quote before. That's brilliant. <laughs> so once the shoe shine boy gives you stock advice, you know it's time to bail. <laughs> yeah. And once like bros who have abs are telling me what right. to do with this ICO and they're saying, I got to invest in these. That's coins. how I feel about crypto, right? <laughs> crypto is now getting the point where it's reached so many people that you're hearing about it everywhere. Like I got a hairdresser doing my hair the other day and she's telling me, I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah, it's about time for me to sell all my coins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I own a bunch. I do too. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to make, it's going to do well. Yeah. I bought it a long time ago. It's I'm, I'm happy. Right. And I think there is like, cool stuff around the technology and i believe in that no i believe in blockchain i believe in totally that this is the future of how currency will be doing but or being be done but i definitely believe there are a ton of charlatans that are now getting involved in it so my theory was listen i'm going to buy in it when a lot of these are low i've already more than doubled a lot of my money pull out what i've invested and then i'll just sit on the rest if it goes somewhere and it goes what everybody thinks it may do then i'm sitting on some good money and i and I'm, i agree with you i'm doing the same thing right. but like some by that logic there will be losers. Right. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I just, I feel horrible for what's going to happen, I think. Uh, yeah. Right. Look, so <laughs> looking looking in the world of tech right now, what company would you say is the most smoke and mirrors right now to you? Like, what company would you say, Ooh. they look really good, but uh, like, they're like not We're doing good. some bus checking. There's a right lot now. of that, don't you think? I feel like oh, we, yeah. we continue to meet people who we get, you meet them, they look so great on on social media. And then they're you're displaying you're magic. Like, what the fuck, dude? Yeah. What it's, and it's never that way, right? Right. It, it always is. In rea- in actuality, you guys know entrepreneurship is like ninety percent like, this fucking sucks. This <laughs> is gonna fail. Yes. <laughs> this is not gonna work. And then it's like, oh fuck, we got it. Yeah. It worked. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what companies do I think is uh, just totally inflated? Um, there's a company called Magic Leap in Florida. Um, they've raised maybe two billion dollars. Right. Um, and they create artificial intelligence, like a virtual reality experience, and they've like never released a product, and it's been like that for like six or seven years. Wow. Two billion dollars, wow. and maybe never- more, maybe more. Oh actually, were they the ones that did holograms? Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Okay, and but they haven't released it yet. They just like tell they've they had only- like a video that was really cool. They've had videos, and that was it. That's all they've had. They've had yeah. videos. <laughs> it's total magic. It's like, like a Kickstarter it's video. Name. Yeah, exactly. Oh, there um, it is, right there. Yeah, so Magic Leap. Uh, I don't know how much money they've raised, but I th- I, it's it's in the billions. And they have, they have this like video and shit that you could use, but you can't actually buy any of this yet. <laughs> okay. So I'm yeah. That's the thing. They just released this thing uh, two weeks ago or three or four weeks ago. Maybe. It looks cool as fuck. Yeah, but that that doesn't exist yet. That's hilarious. Oh, man. Oh, man. See, why don't we just make up some shit, do a website, <laughs> yes. get a bunch of money. <laughs> Promise a lot of things. Yeah. Yes. Um, let's see, what else? There was this company called Theranos where they raised a couple billion dollars and I, the founder seems really cool. She's this like, uh, like 31-year-old like Stanford uh, dropout, which is interesting. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I would like that. I'd like her to win. But she's raised billions of dollars off this te- uh, claiming to have this technology where it can you barely have to poke your finger and you can give blood um, and so you can test your blood very 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 easily turns out that might be a fraud um, <laughs> so I'm not yeah Theranos um, that might crash and burn soon so I would be nervous about that company um, oh, if wow. I was one of the people who invested a ton of money mm. um, what yeah they claim to do all this Crazy shit. What about winners? Who are who? Who do you think are like looking? Really Our most good? underrated companies yeah, right now. You, you see, are going to be badasses in the future. Let's see. There's this mm-hmm. company called Flexport, and what they do is basically there's you know like shipping container like uh, shipper yeah. ship uh, the ships that ship like fucking everything. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> uh, there's actually not that many of them in the world, but they like. Kinda, is it Amazon trying to get their hands in all that? I would bet. I would bet yeah. they are. I mean, that's probably like a trillion dollar issue. I mean, that's actually huge. It is, like. Yeah. 
how do you get like it's so a- Amazon's on their way for that, but it's so intertangled with government and all that stuff. Gangsters you got to get around. Nah, 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 it's yeah. already in the works, bro. Yeah, uh, in the book, the four they talk about that. Amaz- yeah, so, Amazon's on their on their way to. Our t- so are these guys? This company called Flexport. They're trying to build really cool technology that makes it easier to track where your stuff is, and also, um, basically, my father, uh, like a lot, my father's in the shipping industry, and ba- a lot of times what they do is they'll be like, go oh, make phone calls, like, hey, you got room for this? All mm-hmm. right, where are you? Can you come here? And like it's pretty kind of ghetto still, and so these guys are building really cool technology to uh, make o- ocean um, freights like the whole that whole industry more efficient. Yeah, and I think that is awesome, and oh, I think yeah. it's awesome because the guy who runs it, I've seen talks with him, he's a badass, and it's a it's not a sexy industry, and so th- therefore there's probably not a lot of young competitors, and they could they could crush it. Totally yeah. disrupt that for it, sure. Yeah. They're, they've already raised a bunch of funding, but, uh, I had heard about them about two years ago. And if I was who I was maybe four or five years ago and I, and I wanted a job, I would have applied at Flexport. Oh, wow. hmm. Hmm. What are your thoughts on, you made a comment too about the dropout at Stanford. Do what you, what are your thoughts on education right now and the future of that? Ooh, I think that w- I did not go to a, that good of a school and I left early. I ended up getting my degree, but I left early and it was maybe $50,000 a year of tuition and it was not a good school. Schools like that should, uh, you know, those are kind of scams. Mm-hmm. You know, like I used to make fun of like this guy, Ty Lopez. I was like, that's a scam. And then I was like, wait a minute. That might not be a scam. This is the fucking scam that people are a quarter of a million dollars in debt for this bullshit degree that they like mm-hmm. were told they had to do. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that those schools are really screwed. But I actually do like my my girlfriend went to an Ivy League school and I see the access that she has and the education she got. And I'm like, mm. that was actually probably worth that. So I think that like the top, like the top, we'll like separate. my children, I'll be like, look, if you can't go to Ivy League, just go to like a, a cheap state school or go to a trade school. Because I think that's really important to know a trade. If they exist yeah. in that form at that time, because it's so information so accessible now, it's good, it's it's kind of crazy to think that you would someone would spend a quarter million dollars on, you know, learning something. But by that time, probably be over half a million dollars, and you know, three hundred dollar books when you can download something so cheaply. Yeah, and so that that's what I'll tell my kids is like, look, like go to a state school that's like. I don't know what's a state school now. Ten thousand dollars a year, ten or twenty. I think so, like so you can get your experience because that's super important to to learn and talk to people and party. That's all incredibly important. But if you can't, like, I'm not giving you like forty grand to go to a mediocre school that's not reputable. Like, right? It doesn't make sense. It's not gonna give you any leverage yeah. by doing that, right? It's yeah. you're just gonna end up like getting a forty five thousand dollar a year job and be in debt, and you're gonna be left off. Like, you're gonna be screwed. Like, you're gonna thank me for. Do- you know what I mean? I know so many. I'm thankful. My parents helped me out, and I got a scholarship. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm way more lucky than most people. But imagine, do you guys graduate with debt? Imagine. Dude, my, I, my best oh, yeah. friend is a vice principal, but he, he has a hundred thousand dollars in debt. How old is he? He's worth thirty six. Okay, so that's gonna. La- I mean, you're He's, fucked. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's paying <laughs> up forever. What's yeah. the interest rate? Seven percent. I don't, I don't uh, know his interest rate. I think he has a pretty good deal though on his interest rate, but he's pretty much just guaranteed he's going to be paying that loan for the rest of his life. A couple hundred bucks a month for the rest of his well, life. You're not going to let you out of it, right? It's, if I was, if I did, I moved to San Francisco to start a company. I only had a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars at the time. There's no way I could have done that if I had to make even five hundred dollar a month payments. Right. Like it's you're at such a disadvantage. I'm so fortunate that I didn't have that and I got lucky. And it, but like. It's crazy they don't yeah. teach kids that are no one. No, there's no it's education around that. You don't. You think so? It's starting to happen. People are starting. So if you look at the trends, oh, uh, here's a good example. So I used to train a lot of people in the medical industry, and like general practitioners are dropping off uh, considerably um, because the cost of going to, you know, going to school, then getting, you know, uh, you know, becoming a doctor, and the, and then you have to do your internship and all that stuff, and then you graduate and you're going to make not a ton of money. Because amongst doctors, general practitioners are they don't make the you know they like as much as a surgeon. So a lot of them aren't doing that. They're like, well, if I'm going to go to school be a doctor, I have to do this because I know I'll make this much. Because the general practitioner's not going to earn enough to, to to pay that back. And you're seeing a lot of people do that uh, with a lot of different types of careers. There are certain careers you need to go to school for, but there's other ones where it just doesn't make any sense. Like, why am I going to go to school and get a hundred thousand dollar in debt for a business degree when I want to be an entrepreneur? I might be better off learning uh, as an apprentice working for another person who started a business or something like I think like apprenticeships that. are the way to go, um, without a doubt. I think that's what we used to do. We've done that for a long time, and we don't really do it as much anymore. Internships, they try to make that happen, but apprenticeships are are the way to go. And that's why I think trade school is super interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that 
Americans kind of look down upon that type of work. And I think that it's incredibly honorable and really needed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's incredibly important to have that skill. And I, and I think that now what we see is an oversupply of un, literally unskilled workers mm-hmm. uh, that graduate from expensive schools. It's like, okay, so you just spent four years and this much money. What's your skill set? Right. Like, what are you like? What are you? <laughs> what can you do? What are you great at? Yeah. And they what, don't even know. And, yet. Yeah. And what can you be world class at? Because unless you're world class at anything, you're not going to achieve shit. So like, what are you great? What are you mm-hmm. great at? And it's like, uh, well, uh, I don't know. You know, I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's like you don't have to be great when you're 22, but like, what are you pretty good at? Mm. <laughs> what do you, yeah. what kind of advice do you have for young entrepreneurs no, coming up now? No, fuck that, Sam. What would, what advice would you go back and give the, you know, 15 year old version of yourself? What would you go tell yourself? Um, I don't think you should tell him anything. Huh? This kid's crazy. This, kid, <laughs> yeah, this kid's yeah. a hustler, man, for real. No, um, Seven years old, he's reading the <laughs> yeah, that book. Yeah, how to win friends and influence yeah. people. That was. I remember I read that summer of seventh grade, and that was like what I was into. Um, that says everything to me. Yeah. Uh, what? What? You I, like hacked uh, being popular? Yeah, fucking seventh yeah, grade. yeah exactly. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna figure this out. Well, yeah. really, it was like, how do you meet girls? And I wasn't. I was like a nerdy guy. I was like, how do I make girls like me? <laughs> uh, how well that would play out for you. It did okay. It, it was all part of the process. <laughs> it did okay. Uh, let's see. What would I give people? Uh, well, uh, a couple things. Like if I had to do, if I had to like start over again, or I, I would definitely like, you know, it was kind of cool in eighth grade and ninth grade and to like kind of make fun of reading. But, you know, mm. to, to believe that I do believe the whole thing that everyone says of you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with most. And when you're 18, you don't can't really pick to hang out with like superstars, but right. you can read about them all the time. And that's kind of the same thing. So I think Excellent that point. I would just like read a ton. You know, there's not a lot of people who have made massive dents in the world who I rather most all of them consider reading a, a hobby that they do a, a ton of. Right. So reading is incredibly important. Um. I wish that I would have known what meditation was earlier on in my life. Um, I used to think of it was just like a monk in like an orange like blanket, like hum. Yeah, right, 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 right. That's nonsense. Uh, that's not true. So meditation was has been incredibly important to my emotional development, and I wish I would, I would have known that early on because it would have saved me a lot of pain and a lot of time. I would have been able to know, be more self aware. Yeah. Um, I would also um, I would get what I tell people. I read this book by Robert Greene called Mastery early on in my life. Have you read The Power? Yeah. Yeah, I love that one. If you if you look, if you search uh, the 48 Laws of Power summary, you'll see my my summaries number one on Google. Oh, no shit. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. But uh. Mastery is the idea of just how important it is to be really, really good at something. And so I would encourage everyone if they're young, I'm like, look, it doesn't matter if you use this thing in your career or not. The act of learning and becoming great at it, it's not only is it practical, practical because there's always a, you can always make income for being the best at anything, regardless if it's, I mean, like the, if you're the best like cartoonist, like you can make a job just like drawing cartoons for people at a conference. Like mm-hmm. you will always be able to make a living at something. It may not be a lot, but you will always be able to make a living at something. But the act of like dedicating yourself and becoming world class at something is incredibly important. So like just get a skill. Like pick something and make that your thing and be great at it and don't be a generalist. Dude, I, I the best advice mm-hmm. I ever received. I remember I was only about 21 years old and it was a buddy of mine and he told me to stop focusing on the things that you're not good at focus on what you're good at and be fucking great. Yes. That was the best piece of single advice I ever received as a young kid or young entrepreneur growing up. It's made a world of a difference. I think that's so true. It's really important. It doesn't even matter if you use that all the time. Just get great at something. Right. You know, Um, that's just so important because like I think of things really practically, like I even have like money set aside. So if I go bankrupt, I can like get a flight home. (laughs) <laughs> like I'm like very practical, right? And like if you think about really practical, like be very practical, like let's say this doesn't work, this doesn't work out. Well, I can always get a job that pays probably ninety to one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year at a big company doing this because I am good at this, right? So that's like so important just to have something you're good at. Yeah, there's no way you're you're going bankrupt, bro. Because if you did, we'd be the first ones to call you up to hire you for that side of our business. Yeah. But that's not even that's not even that's like not even how I think. Yeah. I think like okay, like. How would my application get seen if I apply to Intuit? Like, do I know someone there who could like forward my application? Like, <laughs> oh, so you go even further. I like to because then if I know yeah. that I have the worst case scenario already planned out for, then I'm okay swinging for the fences because I've accepted the worst case scenario and I know how I will find my way out. You know what <laughs> I mean? That's actually a very effective strategy. If someone taught me that years ago, and it's, I mean, because I, I can get paranoid about certain things like like health and whatever, and they told me, well become okay with worst case scenario and you'll never be afraid. Yeah. So I'll like write out, I'm like the worst case scenario is, is, is that I'll be homeless. 
So when I rode across the country on my motorcycle, I was like, okay, how do I feel with this homelessness? Like, do I feel comfortable with this? It's like, yeah, I'm, I feel okay with this. Like, I can manage. I got my tent. Like, I kind of got it. That it's like, okay, am I okay with this thing? That's a little bit higher. It's like, okay, I'm okay with all this stuff. Therefore, let's swing for the fucking fences. And if yeah. I miss, I'm okay. Right. Yeah. That's super Very cool. cool. What's, uh, what's in the future for your brand? So we want to become a huge media company, a, a, a huge membership company, whatever you want to call it. We want to become a massive thing that it creates lots of hopefully hundreds or hopefully thousands of jobs for people. And so what we have coming up um, is we're going to be ex- ex- expanding our brand. And so you'll see us in a bunch more places that we haven't announced yet. But basically, um, you'll just see us a lot more places, I hope. Um, and so we've got these conferences call- coming up called 2X, which you'll see in... San Francisco, Chicago, Austin, New York. Um, and it's all about succeeding from a, a woman's point of view because they go through a lot of different issues that most dudes have no idea about. And so it's kind of bringing those guys together. Mm. Um, and so that's coming up. Um, and we're also really going to hit our first millionth, our first uh, millionth user. So we're laser focused on going, getting to a million users um, and uh, just continuing pumping out great news any, every day. Any thoughts of moving into this space, into podcasting at all? No, not yet, because I don't think it's our core competency. Hmm. You like a lot of people. I mean, you guys get it, but most people don't about how different that is, th- is. than yeah. writing and stuff like that. What do you think of the space? Are you interested in it at all? Or do you mean what do you what do you think about the space? I am incredibly interested in it. I want to figure out how advertisers can track their mm. their spend because right now advertisers will track and like a lot of people don't use like you know mind body slash. Uh, uh, 99 designs right 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 you know what i mean that's the way that's the only way right now and so there needs to be a better way to track Mm -hmm. that yeah so until that comes once that comes it's gonna shoot up it's in the middle of the vault it's in the middle of evolving right now podcasting's exploded i mean we started our podcast three years ago three years ago i would tell people about uh i'd have to ask them first do you know what a podcast is Mm -hmm. and now i just ask people what do you what podcast you listen to so it's growing very very quickly Oh, it's huge. And so I love expanding markets. This is going to be, I mean, this is obviously, it's going to be way bigger than radio even. I mean, it's going to be huge, right? Like, so, but I, I, I'm i looking for a technology that will solve or a solution to that advertiser problem. Because if that gets solved, I don't know how it could, but if it did, then there's no stopping it. Yeah, uh, yeah because they weren't able to do it with radio either, right? Well, you have like Nielsen, you know, that kind of, it's like, oh, mm-hmm. well, this many people heard it. What's that? What's that? Like Nielsen ratings where they have they would basically put these black boxes on TVs and they could track what people are watching. Okay. And you have that for podcasts too. But I'm not positive if the data is always accurate. No. I don't think it is at all. And right now, the way we handle our sponsors back and forth, so we know... I mean, as long as they, I think the way they look at it, as long as they get their, uh, you know, ROI on it, they're they're fine. You know, they don't think because you can't track exactly. You know, that person could have came, they listened to our show, they first heard about it there, but then they came around and bought it another way, and you have no idea to prove that you did or didn't, right? Right, and I think that, I I bet that could be solved somehow. There's got to be smart guys working on this. This right. will mm-hmm. get solved for. It. But like, what was the? I think the industry last year in, in seventeen, I think it was only like two hundred twenty million dollars spent on mm-hmm. podcast advertising. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're when, gonna like, see that, that quadruple this year. It oh, yeah. needs to. It needs to like keep going. We keep already going, going. we already see it right now. We already see yeah. what's happened. I mean, we oh use- the, the real estate on podcasts is. I mean, it's limited, right? Because you only run one, two, maybe three commercials if you're really good at it, and so it's limited real estate. And uh, you have all. It's very intimate. This year, we're starting, or recently, we're starting to see companies now that are that have a budget for podcast marketing. Maybe Whereas before, be, maybe we should be considering this. There was no podcast yeah. marketing budget. We'll talk, we'll talk off air about some of the numbers and things like that yeah. for sure. I mean, yeah. I I was really excited to meet you and talk to you about uh, the side of the house that we're currently building and working on right now, and uh, we're open to share all of the stuff that we. Yeah, it's we interesting. Know I know Barstool is doing it. I mean, Barstool Sports. You guys mm-hmm. follow those guys? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just like a podcasting network at this point. It seems. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and they're just crushing it. Tim Ferriss, he's one of our investors. He tells mm-hmm. me, or he told me some of the numbers, and I was like, "What? Yeah, it's yeah. mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah. He's yeah. obviously crushing it. Yeah. Awesome. And very, very, uh, very, very fascinating. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in, man. Yeah, thanks for having You're me. You're a real yeah. cool yeah. kid. I yeah. say kid, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. a really fucking cool guy, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really sure. happy to see you succeed like this. this is awesome. Well, hopefully. Yeah, it's sure. anyone. Yeah. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's early. <laughs> Good stuff. Right All right, set. check it out. Go to YouTube. Subscribe to our channel, Mind Pump TV. This month, uh, we have 30 workouts or 30 days of fitness free 
for all of our listeners. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.